or to recognize that, wow, you know, I, what is it that I'm doing with my life? Why are some of my relationships going badly? So what are these problems I'm having? So what was also happening in parallel is probably I've clocked in close to a thousand hours in therapy, Michael. I've done CBT. I did person-centered counseling. I did psychodynamic therapy. I went to gestalt therapy. I went to see relationship counseling. I did group sessions. I saw life coaches, business coaches, sports coaches as well for the events that I did. And, 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 and that, you know, really came as a consequence of some of this turbulence. I'm really grateful to Deepak for being so humble, authentic, in sharing some of the turbulence that he experienced in starting, discovering, researching his own business. And, you know, we don't say it's an easy journey. It never is. So you do need to be aware right up front that you might get some personal challenges. But what's also important to recognize is that you can deal with those with external support, which obviously Deepak did. And that managed to get him through to running his own business today that is successful. Had he not done some of the interventions, maybe he wouldn't have been successful today. A super interesting interview with Deepak and a little bit longer than some of my podcasts, although they do tend to be much longer these days because I don't want to interrupt people with their stories. I want all of the story coming out. And this is not because of therapy for them, maybe it is, but it's for you, the listener, to get a full account of the journey that they've been on. So I hope you enjoy listening to Deepak. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Deepak. How are you today? Michael, I'm fantastic. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And I'm really delighted to be connected to you. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your story because it <laughs> definitely sounds a fascinating one. But before we get into the meat of all of that and hearing about your business, the first question I ask everybody is for you to tell us a little bit about your personal life. So that means where were you born, yep. a bit about your education, where you now live, and then we'll transition into your first job, etc. So over to you. Brilliant. Perfect, Michael. That, that makes sense. I, so I, I was born in a place called Hillingdon, which is... Um, on the outer skirts of West London. That's where I was born, uh, raised in the same area. My, my parents came, they were migrants, economic migrants that came from India, North India in the late 60s. And that's how we all ended up in, in that area because uh, my father to this day still works at Heathrow Airport, actually. Wow. So um, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of um, Indians came over and uh, there's often this actual maybe not quote but but something that you might notice or certainly within kind of our community we always say that uh, you'll find the the, the indians um, at the airports the <laughs> africans at the tube stations the bangladeshis at the docks in line with kind of economic migrant movement and and who were the people that were the kind of economic labor the the, the labor workforce in the 60s and, and and then onwards and now you know it's the poles that um, build the buildings to uh, a large degree so it continues <laughs> i've never ever heard that i promise you that's oh. so interesting um i've never heard that quote before so that's fascinating <laughs> to hear uh, that. yeah <laughs> it's uh, it's something that we we, we that, that got spoken of in, in 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 our family and certainly seemed to be reflective of uh, my my my, tra my my travels on the london underground going over to the the the, the docklands where mm. there's a, a big bangladeshi community and um of course at heathrow you'll find uh, many many uh, indian there's a uh, been over probably seven to ten people in my family that have 
worked ultimately at Heathrow Airport, brothers, uncles, mum, dad, aunties. So uh, there's the, 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 there's been several right from the late 60s and still to this day, my dad's still there. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. Thank mm. you for sharing that. that. I really learned something there. <laughs> Michael, no problem. Um, so I, um, yeah, so that, that, that was where I was born and, and, and raised and, uh, my, my, my twenties, um, well, my education took me to, to Warwick, um, beyond secondary school. Secondary school was interesting. Uh, my school kind of closed down, moved schools and that led to its own turbulence. But, uh, I did end up at Warwick where I studied literature. I was a, I was an art student. So my time was spent with uh, Dickens, Dostoevsky, Flaubert, Chopin, and um, Spark Notes as well. So beyond that, I um, went to work in in the city, uh, and there are many things that followed, which I'm sure you're going to ask me about. And now I live in Fulham in, 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 in London uh, with my little cat jenny who's currently meowing in the background uh <laughs> you may or may not have heard her she's wandered no, off now <laughs> not yet good 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 um, um uh, you may you may yet hear her still doesn't then. matter at all we, <laughs> we love cats on the podcast or dogs as well <laughs> fantastic uh, and i'm here with my partner daniela in in fulham and um that 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 is me um and uh, a brief bit about my background so uh, the education, so Warwick University and doing literature, you said, mm -hmm. what made you go in that direction? You know, um, it, 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 I, I went, it was just something that I was led into. I think mm. certainly growing up, what was, um, what's been interesting about my family um, and uh, Matt Gronin is a great example of a scriptwriter who's popularized this concept of the Indian migrant worker in the form of a poo from The Simpsons, right? Hmm. So what's what's very interesting about a poo is that, um, of course, he works in the corner shop. He's, um, you know, uh, a, a a a a a feature, of course, of 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 the famous Simpsons. And what we we also come to discover that's very secondary to a poo's journey within The Simpsons is that. You know, he is a very well-educated man. I think, you know, he's a professional, a doctor or a lawyer or some such thing. And, you know, he's he's come over to the UK and he then, of course, raises his children who go on to become lawyers, doctors and accountants. And, you know, there's what, what what's really um, fascinating about that is, you know, there's this really interesting parallel with the kind of overperforming south asian community in in the uk that's stemmed a lot from the fact that a lot of the indians or you know others pakistanis that did move over came from you know parents that typically had a, a pretty decent education and of course at that time in the 60s to to get across to the uk you, you'd need to buy a plane ticket or you'd need to rather buy buy buy, buy a boat ticket and it, and it was expensive which mm -hmm. kind of you know zeroed out a lot of the kind of working class so my family have, have been a bit peculiar and and this relates to what i ultimately ended up studying in the 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 only way that we kind of got our fair paid for so to speak to the uk was because my grandfather used to sweep the floor outside the embassy office right. when he was growing up in india my, my parents are from rural india so we come from a sustenance farming background so my, 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 my parents were farmers, their parents' parents were farmers. And, you know, when I first went over to India, where I grew up in 2001, something to that effect, there were, there were no doors, no electricity in the village that, you know, my parents grew up in. And this kind of shocked me at that time. So when I was making my kind of decision as to what to go and study, my, my, you know, and, and thankfully so, perhaps to some degree, my, my parents had had no kind of insight or or ideas as to what it should be. So, you know, when 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 I was finishing up kind of my GCSEs and A levels, I was just simply told, Deepak, you're pretty good at English. <laughs> you should you should do that. And literally, it was as simple as, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> and I had no conception of. The fact that you could study something like economics or philosophy or anything of that ilk at university, 
because I was just used to kind of the very traditional subjects. And literature was, of course, a, a subject that I had studied through from GCSE to A-level. So um, that's that's really why I, I went on to do it. And as I, I, as I discovered, it kind of made for a tough time at university because it was only when I got there that I discovered that this probably wasn't the right thing for me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so difficult at that age, isn't it, for mm -hmm. youngsters to know actually what they should be studying, what kind of job they need to be going into. It's such a difficult time. Mm. And it's almost like, you know, if you were in your 20s, you know, past 25, then you know what you want to do. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> okay, then the studying, you know, why couldn't I go to university at that age? It It seems like the wrong way around almost, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, well, thank you. I'm glad I asked that question because it gave a real nice insight into, you know, what happened because this is often the case, isn't it? We fall into things yeah. sometimes totally by accident. And, well, is it an accident? Is it fate? Is it meant to be? Is it a gift? I mean, you just don't know, do you? Um mm. So when you left university, Warwick, yes. did you know then with your degree what you wanted to do after all that time? I, no, <laughs> I, I, um, you know, I, I think that to a large degree, you know, Michael, I'm, I'm still to some respects figuring out what it is that I want to do with my life. Yeah. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> <laughs> if, yes. if, if, if I'm being brutally honest, mm. you know, there, there's definitely, I think what, so what studying English literature did give me was, um, a, 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 a death of, of my love for reading. I think for a long time, mm. I got into university at Warwick and got down that path really because, you know, from, the ages of about eight to nine, other kids might be kind of outside, I don't know, playing. I, I would be inside reading books. I'd be reading um, uh, books by uh, James Bond novels. I'd be reading this series called uh, the the Amazon Adventures, the African Adventures. And, you know, by, by, by kind of, you know, the age of 11, I was reading, you know, I was being asked to read Dickens and not really understanding a thing that was going on. So, I, I, I got to university and then I suddenly had to study something that I just naturally began to enjoy. And, and that kind of turned away my love for it. And, you know, equally to the same extent that I, I was suggested that English would be good for me. I, I definitely was searching during university for, you know, what it was that I might want to do. And again, you know, the popular thing at Warwick, especially with my friends who were in, you know, Warwick Business School was go and get a corporate job, go and work you know, in the city, certainly in 2006, I think, when I was just finishing up my first and second year, the the, the big kind of, you know, whisper on, on everyone's tongue was, you know, get an internship, get a get get an internship, go, go, go work for a big firm. Yes. So, you know, that ended up being Deloitte for me. Right. I, I, I finished, I finished university and I had uh, a couple of, of choices. One of the choices was, you know, working within the media industry. Um, I think they're called Wavemaker now, but they were called Media Edge CIA at that time. They were a WPP company. And I, I do, um, I, I, I did start there. Again, realized that, well, I know that this isn't for me. It doesn't mean that I do know what it, what I want to do. But, you know, at that choice, at that time, my, my, my thinking was very black and white. I was like, well, media are to pay me 18K. Deloitte are going to pay me 27. Okay, fine. Let's just go to Deloitte. Yeah, so, of course. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. So I, 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 I kind of went there. Um, and this was, you know, in, in between this, I, I backpacked. I, you know, I went to South America and traveled and partied. I backpacked before university as well. So right. I, I, I'd spent six months away before going to university because even at that time, I, 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 I wasn't sure really, you know, what my path should, would, or, or might be. Um, so I, I, whilst I hadn't found my feet, I, I ultimately ended up picking what seemed to be the sensible options. So Deloitte was the 
logical option. And I remember going to a networking event and meeting one of the associate directors, Stephen. He was about seven years in. He was about seven promotions ahead of me. I was one of the you know new kids on the block on the graduate intern on the graduate program right. in the tax consulting department, and I got to you know talk to him and and share five minutes of of his time, his vaulted time. And, you know, it was an exciting thing then. And I just remember looking into his eyes and thinking, God, this looks like it could be really boring. So mm. I, <laughs> I, I, I absolutely know that I don't want to do this either. Mm. So what, what followed was me ultimately handing in my resignation. Um, uh, I think I lasted at Deloitte four months, ultimately. And I think the longest time I've been in employment ever has been six months. Um, so that was um, kind of what I ended up going off to do at, at, after, after university. And I, I, I left Deloitte because I decided at that time that, right, I'm going to become a rapper. And <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, okay we haven't talked about your musical interests yet (laughs) but certainly i i I guess what i definitely can say is as 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 as, is a a, you know my 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 life has 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 been a a series of almost perpendicular transitions (laughs) right (laughs) why a rapper deepak (laughs) yeah i uh, i i um well, I loved. I still love music. I love. I love. I love UK grime. I love hip hop. Yeah, it drives my partner crazy because she's this wonderful Italian lady who listens to a lot of kind of you know Italian pop and maybe jazz music, and then I'll intersperse it with Drake and Fifty Cent, <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she she will just chime in with Porca Putana. <laughs> Kick out so I'm on air and then t- turn off Alexa and uh we 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 we, we have our fights. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> um yeah, so Michael, I um you know, I I, I, I wanted to be a rapper because I, I, I did love music. I loved it since I was fourteen and rapping was a thing that I was doing before I went to university and you know, I was part of a group and we we'd been on I think we'd been on we we performed at shows at university I ended up performing um on 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 bbc radio you know one west midlands artist of the month we'd got our own couple of music videos out and produced kind of some some kind of mixtapes and i i i i I really enjoyed the creative process of it i think yeah 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 it was it was the creative process it's the wordplay it's uh, music yeah it's the aesthetic of music i guess so that explains the literature bit more to mm. me now, now you've said that, because there's a lot of words in rapping, you know, there's more focus on words, I believe, than yeah. reg. Okay, every song has lyrics, but rapping has more lyrics, if you know what I mean, the focus yeah. is more on lyrics. So that explains for me more the whole English literature bit too. Yeah. Because yeah. You're, you're, you enjoy words, don't you, basically? <laughs> Yeah, always have, always will. Uh, I guess it was just deciding which vehicle that that, that I'd use to, to 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 express kind of you know my my power through language. Yeah, got it, got it. Okay, that's really interesting. That forms some really interesting picture about you now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Deloitte wasn't going to help you with your your interest in words and rapping and. It didn't give me the creative outlet that I wanted. No, no. It, it, it was, it was, um, you know, there was a structure and there was a path that was laid out for me. It was 2009. All of the logical things suggested that I should stay at Deloitte. You know, the, there'd been the credit crunch. I had a lot mm. of friends who were economists that, you know, had, w- could not find work or had been made redundant mm. and, all of these kinds of, of things. And, you know, it was, you know, my, the perception was, wow, Deepak, you know, you're an art student and you've got a job at Deloitte and you're in the right. London office and, you know, don't pass this up. And, you know, I, 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 at the same time, I was, I was, you know, 
I was just not good at being a tax consultant. I, 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 I am not good at the minutia. I am not detail orientated. And I just inherently did not enjoy the process of learning about tax statutes and litigation and all of the surrounding rigmarole. And it did mean even in those early stages where I excelled was in the present, you know, the presentation elements of our actual training where I struggled was when, you know, I had to, you know, cite things kind of verse and chapter. And I just quickly recognized that, you know, I, I did want to be successful, but this wasn't going to be the environment that I could succeed in. And I, 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 I left, I left Deloitte and mm. I immediately, um, I, I still remember actually, I, I had basically a, a vision of thinking, right, if I want to be a rapper, I'm probably going to, I'm going to need to, you know, make money as well. And that's something that had been instilled in me from a young age that, you know, if I wanted anything, I'd need to earn it myself. I need to pay for it myself. So, you know, my first job at 12, I was doing the paper round and then I'd get bored of the paper round and I'd dump all of the papers in the bin and, <laughs> and just see if I could still get paid. And, you know, that was that. And then I moved to becoming a mechanics assistant at Motest and I was getting paid two pound 50 per hour and because I was underage, but you know, they didn't mind that. So they were happy to pay me at 14 years old. And then I quickly, after a couple of months stopped going because I just was not motivated to earn seven pound 50 for, for three hours. And my five pound budget that my parents gave me per week didn't really get me anywhere. It wasn't mm -hmm. even quite enough for a cinema ticket. So then mm -hmm. I started working as a laborer at my local market whilst I was doing my A-levels. And what my parents gave me, I think that has always helped me was, you know, I, I, I learned by the example of the work ethic of my mom and dad. Yeah. I, what's really interesting and, and I'm sure there's lots of listeners who have this is that if you come to our house, you know, my parents, and I'm, I'm going to go and see my mom later today, actually, you will find us often time at dinner eating in separate rooms or eating around a table together, but not really saying much or my parents having the TV on in the background and me maybe sitting there with my laptop watching something else also at the same dinner table eating. And people sometimes look at it and think, well, this is, this is really odd. What's going on. And the reason for that was, was, you know, growing up, my, my dad, if my dad was working in the daytime, my mum was looking after us. If my dad came back from work, then my mum was, you know, out working. And my parents, you know, they were, you know, I'm one of five. And it was a, a big challenge for my parents to raise us. And my dad ultimately has spent, you know, his, his last 30 years just working 100 hour weeks, always, mm. just always to ensure that he could, you know, afford what was necessary to make sure that we at least got an education. And what that meant was, you know, dinners were often, you know, moments that you could snatch and, you know, time together was really focused around, okay, well, you know, um, just make sure that you work hard and make sure you go to school and get good grades. And, and the time that, or the cherished time that we could spend together was kind of fleeting. And what that gave me was a work ethic, Michael that's what it gave me. So I left yes. Deloitte. I immediately figured, right, I, 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 I've got about one or 2000 pounds from the loan, the golden handshake, they call it that Deloitte give you. <laughs> and I had a couple of months to pay it back. So what am I going to do? My dad said he'd, he, my, my dad said he was willing to bail me out, but you know, I needed to make my best effort at doing it myself. So I t took the skill set that I knew that I had reading and I began to apply it to the challenge of, well, maybe if I start a recording studio, then I can record my own music. I can record other musicians' music. I can build my network and I can leverage that into greater things. Mm. So that's where Deep Impact Recordings got blown life into. That was, you know, a journey that I went on. And I didn't really know the first thing about how to run a business or how to set up a recording studio, but I figured that I could figure that all out if I just bought a couple of books from Amazon. Sure. Wow. So my 
time spent between handing in my resignation to Matthew Ellis. He was the tax partner in my office at that time when I went in and, and told him uh, that you know I'm leaving to, <laughs> to pursue my career in rap. Was spent uh, my evenings were spent. Um, you know, I, I I bought a bunch of books. I bought. You know, I called a couple of being I initially started with calling a couple of recording studios and I, I was laughed off the phone when I said, look, I've got a three thousand pound budget. You know, this is back in 2008 mine. So it wasn't the case of uh, a MacBook and, you know, a blue snowball mic that you could use today to perhaps record. Um, so, you know, I was told, you know, you, you need this, you need that, you need soundproofing. You need. So, so you know, I, I quickly began Googling, well, what is soundproofing made out of? Ah, soundproofing is actually the, the composite materials, carbon fiberglass. And I thought, ah, okay, so where can I find carbon fiberglass? And I Googled carbon fiberglass. And then I saw it was loft insulation. And then I thought, where can I buy loft insulation? And then I Googled loft insulation near me, B&Q. And then I thought, <laughs> oh, how much is loft insulation in B&Q? I Googled that, five pound a roll for three yards. And I thought, ah, how many yards do I need to cover just a box? Because I had basically my a spare room that my parents were willing to let me gut if I could, you know, build a business there. And 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 this is a room that's about as big as a, you know, a kitchen that you might find in a two bedroom flat. Mm. So I ultimately thought, OK, well, 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 let's do this. So I called a couple of studios. I've been told that I, my budget was simply not enough. Mm. I thought instead, well, you know, I don't know what I don't know. How can I make my, I thought this is the money that I've got. How can I make my budget work? So practically I asked my dad, let's, 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 let's plumb your Indian network. Dad, do you know a carpenter or a cheap Indian who can come over and help me build this little booth? And he said, right, I know a guy. Great. Then where do we find the materials from? Right. Let's go to the local timber yard. Great. What do we need? I need to get build a, a, a two by two door that slides open and shut. Okay, great. Let's get, let's buy the wood. How much is that? A hundred quid. Great. I can afford that. Right. Mm -hmm. How much is your guy? It's going to come in 50 quid to do it for it. It's going to take an hour just to quickly put it up. Okay. Brilliant. Let's go and buy this carbon fiberglass. Okay. Wow. As it turns out, carbon fiberglass, if you inhale it, well, it's got glass inside it, so you're not mm. meant to inhale it. And I thought, oh, so I probably need to cover it with something. And you can buy, in Southall, yards of fabric, because that's what we'd use to, you know, my mum would sometimes use to help, you know, do ceremonies at home, like bulges, or she'd use it for lengas, which are like Indian dresses. So I said, mum, I'm going to go to Southall. Where, where's a shop that I can buy fabric from for like, you know, a pound a yard or whatever? She was like, it's here. So brilliant. So I went and bought, you know, for 30 quid, 30 yards. And then I thought, how the hell do I nail this to the actual, you know, uh, a normal stapler? How, how, how do I how do I nail this into the actual, you know, wood that we've just created? And I went back to B&Q. I got a wooden staple gun. OK, great. I've got this really ugly looking board now. It just <laughs> looks horrendous. <laughs> 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 in parallel, I had, um, you know, gone onto Amazon. I bought a couple of books. I bought, I, I, I bought, I, I was looking first of all in the recording studio. So I bought Gorilla Home Recording Studio. I bought a book about Gorilla Home Recordings. I thought, what equipment do I need? Okay, so I need something called a Mac. Great. I need something called Logic. Great. These are like my most expensive buys. I yes. thought, okay, where can I get a secondhand Mac? Okay, great. You can get one on Gumtree. Okay, fine. I'm going to try and do that. Okay, where can I get Logic? Okay, wow. Logic is a piece of software. Maybe I can find a torrent or a copy. Do I know someone? Well, I used to be, a, well, I am a rapper. So of course, who do I know? I know rappers. And what do rappers do really well? They torrent stuff. So, right. you know, through, through the network, I managed to find someone who could get me a bootleg copy of Logic. I was like, right. So, you know, I went through the installation. And so what followed was a really intensive period of, of learning, learning and doing, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Learning, doing, learning, doing, trying to figure it out. And then I thought, right, so I've got this studio built, but I know nothing about business. What do I do? Uh, okay, great. How to, you know, how to build a business. What also began to came up when I was looking for these searches within Amazon was suggested books, you know, other readers may like. And then I got introduced, introduced to this world of rich dad, poor dad. Oh, that looks interesting. Okay. Let me mm. buy that. Oh, the monk who sold his Ferrari. What's that? Okay. I'll buy that. Oh, chicken soup for the soul. Okay, mm. cool. I'll buy that. And I began to 
be infused with this really different series of learning mm. that I had never to date encountered. And, and, and that moment, Michael, was, was a real turning point, I think, in my life, well, looking back. You, I'll go to interject so you can catch a bit of breath and have a drink of water. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you. what you're describing is perfect because that's the whole thing we just talked about. You did all your learning through school and university. You came out with a qualification and then the real learning started. After Deloitte, you went, right, OK, this isn't working. This isn't, you know, this isn't creative for me. I need to be creative. And then you went out and decided to do something. And that's when your real learning started. And we're not given, this is where the massive gap is in education. Mm. We should all be given those tools. That learning that you went through, we should go through that learning. And I, and I know it's not the same when you're talking about these things theoretically, Yeah. but we shouldn't do it theoretically. You know, we should get students together and say, right, six of you are going to create your own business. Off you go. Go and find yeah. out how to do it. You know, yeah. <laughs> here, here are a few materials. Go and make it happen. Open a recording mm. studio in London somewhere. That's how it should be done. And it's so wonderful to hear your experience that you had a motivation of, okay, paying back a loan of two grand. That was one thing. But you mm. also had a passion about rapping. You came up with an idea that then consumed you in terms of, I want to learn everything about how to create this. I'm going away and getting this done. And that's before we got onto the recording. I, I kind of briefly explained to you I wanted to learn how to do podcasting. But when mm. I decided mm. I want to do podcasting, you find the information you need to learn how to do it. But yeah. it's only when you decide that's what I want to do. Everything is there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. That's a wonderful story. And, and okay, so tell us then, did the studio get built and did you start doing recordings? What followed was a wild journey into the world that became Deep Impact Recordings. As <laughs> I had a singer come in once to the studio that was, you know, a spare room next to the kitchen in my mum's house. It's really funny, you know, Michael, what would happen is that I would have like the, you know, rappers of, 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 of various manners of character and repute that would, um, you know, turn up to my studio, um, you know, uh, a, sl a slap of cash in one hand and maybe some marijuana in the other, or maybe a CD or a USB stick, um, you know, ready to go. And they would walk ultimately in through the gates to, you know, my front doorstep, turn an immediate left and slowly walk around the back of the house through the gated back garden and then come in through the back door into the kitchen of my parents' house because mm. this was where my studio was. And the first thing that they would be met with were the sweet smells of dal, chapati, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and my grandmother just there perhaps sometimes making popcorn or making some Indian dishes. And my <laughs> grandmother, bless her, you you meet her, Michael, she will not smile for anybody. No. <laughs> <laughs> She'll just kind of stare at you and you'll think, wow, I've really pissed this lady off. I'm like, what, what did I do? So the, the, the and, and rappers tend to turn up in groups, okay? So yes. there'd be there'd be there'd be, you know, there'd be Will and then there'd be, you know, Willie's entourage. And that would be six guys who just want to stand around a studio, which is basically the size of, you know, a, a, a kitchen, as we said, in a two bedroom flat. So all of a sudden, they, they've all traipsed in. My grandmother's just staring them all down. They don't know what to make of it. She doesn't know what to make of it. They all bundle into this tiny room now that it's become because there's one guy who's going to be in this booth that, you know, you can't really even walk more than one step within. Mm -hmm. And then outside of that, you've got these guys who, you know, are ultimately, you know, lighting up their, their smokes, lighting up their weed and beginning to chit chatter amongst themselves, I being a complete non-smoker, I'm already high as a kite, basically, <laughs> <laughs> about 
15 minutes in and, and everybody's clock watching, everybody's, you know, demanding, or rather I'm the only one that's clock watching. Yes. Everybody's doing the opposite. They turn up 15 minutes late. They want to stay for another hour. I have to juggle, you know, six different people who are ultimately the noise that's getting in the way of the music because these guys have got their own egos. They've got their own questions and requests. They maybe will spill out into the kitchen. Maybe they'll go into the back garden I need to keep an eye on everything. I've got, you know, my head burrowed into my my MacBook as well as my mixing desk and they've got all, you know, I've got their backs to all of these guys. Michael, it was brilliant. <laughs> it gave me a massive education in communication, in mm. assertiveness, in dialogue, in multitasking because I had to deal with the needs of the rapper. They had the expectation that everything was done yesterday. I had to work out the issues of everybody trying to haggle me down, of people trying to, you know, ask for, you know, or to give me my price, 15 pounds, when in reality they'd been there recording for an hour and a half, or not respect the fact that they'd come 15 minutes later. I needed to adapt to deal with these circumstances and have a no smoking within the studio, which moved into a, uh, you can smoke in the garden, which moved into the, you have to smoke at the back of the garden, which moved to, okay, I need to keep a clock because a regular, you know, digital or analog clock in the studio isn't enough. I need a countdown timer. Yes. I need countdown from when the actual hour, the paid hour starts. And I need to maybe send them a screenshot. I also need to entertain these other guys that came up. So I got a, cheap and cheerful PC that could connect to Wi-Fi um, and have and then let them ultimately be on that machine. That became a great marketing tool because then I could post live updates as they would sometimes saying Deep Impact Recording Studio Time on their Facebook. And that became a secondary marketing mechanism. Then I began to understand about tags and just little bits and pieces that related to at least the Facebook algorithm at that time. And the fact that they would tag their friends and their friends would appear and I would sit and have instant messenger open up, opened up like a multi-chat IM messenger tool at that time, I think it was pigeon. It still exists today. And I would have, whilst I was in the studio recording will, I'd have Will's friend messaging me saying, yo, Will's at your studio. Can I book in fam in between recording Will's music? So in the world of music, people expect instant responses. And then I would respond, Mike, I was in my element. Mm. I loved it. Mm. <laughs> it was, it was the education just continued. I bet. It developed into two recording studios. I ended up getting the, the blue room and the red room. My, my, my music career began to take somewhat of a backseat as I began to or as I discovered that I enjoyed the process of building the, the, the creation, the creative process around building the business side yes. of deep impact recordings more. And, 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 and I gave that, you know, a lot more time than I really gave my music. And that's it was, understandable though, isn't it? I mean, that's totally understandable. Mm, mm, mm. Um, certainly I thought at this, at, at that time it was, um, I've, I've, I've come to kind of, you know, uh, reflect on things perhaps a bit differently um, as I've got older. Mm. Uh, but but certainly the, the 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 studio, Deep Impact Recordings, the Blue Room and the Red Room. And if anyone um, is you know curious, Google Deep Impact Recordings, Deepak with a K. You'll find my old studio. You'll find the musicians. I've still got a hundred plus Facebook photo albums and all of these guys. There's my, my songs still exist on YouTube. There's, there's the kind of graveyard, if you will, <laughs> of, 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 of that life. And ultimately, Michael, what followed was a, a series of, of, of perpendicular turns within business as I began to kind of iterate, adjust, learn, and, and move into entirely different industries um, in kind of quick succession as, as different things happened. And I allowed my life to almost turn on a sixpence, if you will, as, 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 as things befell me or I had ideas as I got older and probably a bit more mature and figured out some of my own personal problems that I, I began to, you know, determine my direction rather than to allow opportunity to, to, opportunity to lead me. Certainly as I did, I think, from, you know, around 18 to, to 25. Got it. Got it. Okay, so you're kind of saying you can have a look and learn all about it. So I take it in that you're not doing it anymore. 
Absolutely. I think yeah. that, so, um, you know, what that gave me was an understanding of how to make money. Right. Actually. Yes. And it grew. Yes. That, 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 that's what it gave me. You know, mm. I remember being so proud when I went next door into the living room and my dad was sat down, maybe watching TV. And I'd say, dad, I made 60 quid today. It'd be like amazing, you know, four hours or whatever. Mm. And, and, you know, another day would follow and it'd be like, dad, you know, I made 130 quid today and, you know, it was cash. And, you know, that, 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 that those numbers, as I, as I began to learn and grow, began, began to evolve. And what, what that gave me, Michael, you know what? It gave me a freedom ticket in that I began to very basically understand negotiation. I began to understand upsells. I began to understand the, the, the basics of operating a physical business. I began to understand a little bit about like marketing and mm. how to engage in influencer marketing because then I would, you know, do freebies for musicians that had, you know, big names and then see a flurry of customers that came consequently. And I saw that when they put up, you know, my music on, on, on their sites, I would see maybe, you know, an, an uplift. In, and at that time I ran the whole business from a Facebook page and my mobile phone, I'd see an uplift in, you know, my connection requests. And then I began to explore Facebook messenger bots because I thought, well, Will's probably got a load of friends who are musicians. How can I allow, and you know, Facebook was less sophisticated with this algorithm at that time, bots worked. So I could use a little piece of JavaScript, again, something that I just Googled, because I was like, I want to add all of Will's friends whilst he's in the studio, but I want to do it automatically. So I would Google Facebook auto adder, and then I would just try and find something until it worked. And they'd be like, oh, there's a little piece of JavaScript that if I put it into my browser, apparently I can add, hey, Michael, and then I'd have, you know, the customized message. And and these are the things that I was doing in parallel to try and grow. So, you know, we, 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 we probably did about 25 to 30 grand in our first year. And, and, and that was given that we were charging 15 to 20 pounds an hour was it was quite a sizable thing. Yeah. Um, and and it really, you know, all came from that, that 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 work ethic and that process of trying, doing, learning, failing, testing, and just following it around in a virtuous loop and, mm. and not giving myself time to kind of dwell upon it. So that transitioned into a series of small businesses that I've had. But I think the the, the broader point that I kind of want to want to want to to, to illustrate, and I think this is for for, for, for everybody that. The, the number one skill I think that everybody should learn, especially in today's age, is, is, is the art of, you know, how to exchange your time for money. Mm. It's, it's, it's simple. It's, it's more achievable than building an e-commerce business or building, you know, an info product or, or building something that, you know, is, 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 is perhaps one step removed from a transactional act. Because as a consequence of doing that, Michael, as you probably saw on my LinkedIn, I, 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 end, I spent a lot of my 20s traveling. I spent a lot of my 20s outside of the UK. I spent a lot of my time doing endurance sports. And, and my, my experimentation with life continued, but much less so in the space of business because I, I, I then started a tutoring agency called Gobsmackers. I, I quickly figured out how to get it to a stage where I could do about 10 to 12 grand a month if I was in the UK. But if I, if, if, if I reduce my hours to about 10 to 15 hours a week, I could run it remotely and I could still make three to four thousand pounds a month. Mm. And that bought me my freedom, Michael. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm, mm. So, so, so from the ages of about 24 to 28, 29, I was in, I was back and forth in and out of the UK living maybe in Lisbon, then I moved to Rio, then I moved to Amsterdam, then I applied to the British military and I went off and did a special forces application. Then I fought Thai kickboxing. Then I decided I'd want to do a, a whole range of kind of weird and wonderful things. I went back to South America. We, you know, I was in Brazil and then I traveled again after that. And I, 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 I used that time and that little bit that I learned about how to generate an income to just explore life, I think. And, and, and also to figure out a lot of my own personal issues, if I'm being honest, mm. there's, there's a lot of repercussions. I think that, you know, what, 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 what money gave me, or at least the ability to earn a little bit of money was the, 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 the time it gave me time, Michael. So my twenties or, or the twenties of, of, for most people, you know, we, we spend our twenties pursuing entrepreneurship 
or pursuing a career or pursuing traveling for maybe a year, but then actually you go back into entrepreneurship. And, yes. and, and, and that's the routes. They're, they're really the two routes that are laid out for us, really. It's, it's it be an entrepreneur or, or be a successful executive. Do travel along the way, but that's really secondary to, you know, maybe you could be a digital nomad, but, you know, it's, it's, it's cool to an extent, but, you know, run a company. I, I didn't want to run a company, Michael. I didn't want to, you know, I remember I got to a stage where I made about 27 grand, I think, in cash. And then I immediately shut down my tutoring agency by turning off my mobile phone, shutting down my Facebook page, ignoring all my clients. And then I pissed off for seven months. because I, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I raised about 75 grand in capital from a, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you call that quite angel, but it was from a series of ex Goldman guys who had, you know, things had developed and, and then, and then I, th- that relationship went sour because I immediately pissed off to Lisbon and then I started partying and, mm-hmm. and, and, and I blew their money really not just, just, I allowed the cost to balloon. I spent a decent amount of their money organizing events, Sado parties basically in Lisbon. And, um, I, I just spent a lot of time enjoying myself, which was, which is brilliant. And, and I think that, you know, this is, this is the third path <laughs> that I think is, is not laid out in any literature that I've seen anywhere that. You know what? You, you you only have your twenties once. Yes. So so live, love, experience, and the the you know the careers and all of the, all of that good stuff. Heck, you could start your career in your forties and become a successful entrepreneur at fifty five. It it really doesn't matter. And I think that that's one been one of the downsides I've discovered from the 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 kind of instant culture that we live in. You know, the the age of the nineteen year old multi millionaire. The, 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 that is the expectation. Um, and, 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 and the other side of it, I think that, and, and, and that relates to, you know, our conversation that we're having here today, that what that also gave me, which was, a, a, a you know, a bane as well as a blessing was it gave me time to introspect Michael and to, 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 to cope with, or to recognize that, wow, you know, I, w- what is it that I'm doing with my life? Why are some of my relationships going badly? So what are these problems I'm having? So what was also happening in parallel is probably I've clocked in close to a thousand hours in therapy, Michael. Mm. I've done CBT. I did person-centered counseling. I did psychodynamic therapy. I went to gestalt therapy. I went to see relationship counseling. I did group sessions. I saw life coaches, business coaches, sports coaches as well for the events that I did. And, mm. and, 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 and that, you know, really came as a consequence of some of this turbulence, you know, there's, there's repercussions that you don't realize exist in your life when ultimately you're a child who was raised by children because, you know, my parents were 11 and 13 when they got married. That was the first time they met was the first time that they were ma- that w- was when they were married. And, you know, they had my, my sisters at, at 15 and, you know, 14, my mum dropped out of school to become a housewife in Harmonsworth near Heathrow Airport. And my dad didn't see his children for the first two years because he was trying to raise funds in India to even afford to get across. And he turned up with £20 on his pocket because all of the money he'd spent was, you know, for the plane flight over. And, you know, it, it led to a lot of turbulence in my life because my parents, of course, they didn't know what they're doing. I mean, they were 15 without education, trying to raise a family. And they did what they thought was sensible. And I love them for it. They put their head down. They worked and mm. worked so that they could give us, you know, the opportunity to be on a podcast with someone like you and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and to talk about this life that I've lived. So it's, it's, it's been an interesting time, Michael. It's, it's really amazing. And thank you for being so open and sharing all of that because it, it's part of the territory as well, isn't it? So there is personal growth and development that goes hand in hand with, you know, looking at ways of how you can create money for yourself, doing your own thing that you love doing. And, you know, sometimes it does take a while and ex- experimentation. I think part of the part of the journey in running your own business is experimentation, but actually at the time you think you're failing when actually you're not, you're just going through the process in finding finally what it is that you enjoy the most. And it doesn't mean that you didn't enjoy what you did, but at the end of it, you probably thought, actually, that probably wasn't what I enjoyed the most. But 
without it, it wouldn't have prepared you for what you're doing today. So it's it is part of the process and the journey. But whilst we're in it, we don't realize that, you mm -hmm. know, it might be it might be looking fearful and there may be a lot of doubts uh, that are going. And and yeah, sometimes we do need support and help from people around us or strangers to get us back on track. So well done for doing all of that. Amazing. Ah, thank you, Michael, for allowing me to share my story and, you know, hope that this is of of, of some, you know, some interest and maybe, you know, some, some, some learnings perhaps to, 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 to your audience. Most definitely. Most definitely. So can we get to what you're doing today? <laughs> yes, of course. I run an SEO agency with Pearl Lemon. We were incorporated in October, 2016. Uh, again, a similar, similar, similar beginnings to the extent certainly that, you know, I had finished ultimately um, a unsuccessful application to the special forces. Um, I, I came back home, back to my mum's, and here I was again at 30, broke, trying to figure out what it is that I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, what am I good at and what do I enjoy? And, you know, by, by that stage, I, I developed uh, at least a little bit of a history in terms of understanding how to take something and make it grow. Yes. So I thought, well, maybe I can offer that as a service to others. So that was really the, the, the beginnings of, 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 of Pearl Lemon. At that time, it was called Per Traffic. I, I started with a partner. We had different visions of how we built the business. So we, we parted ways about eight months in, and, and then I rebranded, and we became Pearl Lemon. And I started focusing upon the SEO side as a company in September of 2017. So, you know, maybe about 14 months, the first 14 months of, of what's maybe been maybe yeah, yeah, a 28 month journey or something overall or something like that mm -hmm. really were just about trying to keep my lights on Michael. Mm. It was about trying to make some money and then get out of my mom's house. Yeah. That was, that was, that was, that was it. So at that stage, you know, and, and I think that this is crucial to anyone with business building that I think that, you know, don't leave your ego at the door and don't be afraid of the dog work. And for me, that was putting ads on Gumtree. That was putting ads on Craigslist. That was writing a status update on LinkedIn. That was messaging anybody and everybody and accepting anything that came through the door, so to speak. So I, I, I you know, I, I, I do a landing page and it would take me, you know, four hours because I'd never used Unbounce before as a platform. But then I'd say, yeah, I can do it. No problem. hundred quid. Great. And then I'd figure out how to use Unbounce by going on to a tutorial, figuring it out, doing it, delivering it and, and following that in a virtuous loop in those spaces that I wasn't familiar with Unbounce being one example. And then there was stuff that I was more familiar with. And Really, once we got to the stage where, as a business, we were getting, I say we, it was I for the first, for the first four months, it was myself, there was no one else. Um, you know, days were spent trying to do delivery like that. Nights were spent maybe on, on Udemy, on YouTube, learning, you know, watching Reddit tutorials, watching, you know, a Moz case study about SEO, watching something about PR releases and not quite think, realizing or deciding exactly how I wanted my agency to turn out because I just thought, well, no more, do more and, and let's see what happens. And my, 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 my first SEO client, George, George Ustianis, um, he came to me via Upwork, I think in August, uh, August, yeah, July, July or August of 2017. And I remember still when he said to me, okay, Deepak, I know and I appreciate the SEO because he came asking something to do with Facebook and I'd done Facebook before. So I thought, okay, great. So we got into this call. He said, Deepak, actually, it turned out what he wanted was SEO. And he said, Deepak, you know, I know that SEO takes time. I know that we need three to six months to really see results. And Michael, as soon as he said those words to me, I know that we need three to six months. I know that it takes time. I thought, aha, <laughs> this is, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. I said, yeah, George, no problem. I can do it. I, I got off the call. And at that time, and we were up to maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 grand by then or something, um, uh, in terms of like monthly recurring, well, it wasn't, it wasn't recurring. And this was the problem. I had like a lot of one-off projects or fixed projects and they would start, they would stop. And, and I was still learning the process of 
doing B2B because Gobsmackers was a tutoring agency, it was B2C. My recording studio, Deep Impact Recordings, was B2C. I'd never done anything in a B2B environment, so there's also a little bit of anxiety that I had as to how business should be run. And I'd taken the advice from my partner who I'd with historically as to, you know, he, he was much more traditional than me. He's got an office in central London. He's got like 10, uh, 10 11 employees. They pride themselves of being, they're a development company. They were starting their marketing agency. We decided to partner. They pride themselves on you can visit us face to face. All of our clients are within the M25. And I come from this background of being a digital nomad. Yes. And I was like, I don't care if my staff are from Timbuktu. I don't want to see them. I don't want to speak to them. <laughs> I want to do everything on Zoom, on Skype, WhatsApp. His client, who he made intros to, rightly so, it was fantastic. They wanted to meet me. I was like, why do you want to meet me for? Can't we just like have a call on WhatsApp? And this was just like, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and they were, you know, people of the old guard, so to speak. They wanted to sit, they wanted to discuss, talk framework. And, and I was just, yeah, cool, let's do it. You know, and, and, and uh, you know, I, I was very much more Del Boy and Rodney. Mm. I'm, I'm very much a scrapper. Um, so, so, so that was what, you know, made us realize, and we're still good friends, Nick, Nick Ellison at Per Digital. You know, we're still good friends and we realize that, you know, what we've got different kind of different visions <laughs> of, of, of how to run a company. But at that point, Michael, I decided immediately right we're going to be an seo agency so it took me 12 months but now of course it's january 2019 but it took me from august 2017 to august 2018 to to move from ultimately the same levels of revenue but moving from 90 percent non-seo to 100 percent seo and it took me a year to turn it around. And that's also when I began my journey. And you could kind of reverse engineer and have it. I was like, right, people, I, I need to learn as much as I can learn. I need to deliver as fast as I can. But I also need to be recognized as the expert. So then I began appearing on SEM Rush. Then, you know, we just recently got a feature on Search Engine Journal. I'm now a Google paid expert on the space of SEO, uh, Avado, who partnered with Google about the space of SEO. And I aggressively went on a journey to position myself as the expert to begin producing SEO content. And, and, and it was really was that one moment when George told me that. And I thought, oh, wow. So people come into SEO expecting to be on retainer. I love this business. Let's yes. do it. Yes. Um, and, and, and it's still, you know, and it's marketing. I enjoy marketing. I enjoy the challenge of it. And, and what I have discovered as a consequence of it and why I'm still doing it now and I haven't, let's say, pivoted again is because I enjoy the technical complexity in line with also the creative aspects of the fact that it's, you know, there's still a big content drive that you need to, of course, look at LinkedIn and, and all of these other bits and pieces. So, 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 so that was where the journey started. And Paul Lemon today, you know, we, we, we're, we're fortunate to, 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 to have grown quickly to, 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 to be doing well. And, you know, I, I still put it down to that work ethic that my parents gave me, Michael, if anything, to be honest with you. Mm. Mm. Of course. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that the whole journey that you went through, even when you were doing the thing in building your recording studio, I heard you say several times, I Google this, and then I Google that, and then I yeah. search for this, and then I search for that. And, you know, everything starts with the search. Yeah. That's why, ah, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's why Google, Google will still be around, even though, saying something that people might scream at now is, even though Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, and they will all disappear in 10 years time, potentially, mm. unlikely, but let's say, you know, in May, the one that won't disappear are Google and Amazon. You know, they won't disappear yeah. because yeah. the default for, I would say, at least 85 to 90% of people is to go to Google and search or go to Amazon and search. Mm. Um, and Absolutely. Because it's the easy thing to do and we're also time poor and lazy and therefore we don't want to go anywhere else i mean i think people underestimate places like linkedin um i used to teach people how to use linkedin for five years but i got bored with it, it was just part of a you know similar yeah. thing you just kind of go okay i'm not enjoying this anymore so i'm going to stop it but yeah. the, the search on there is very powerful if you want to look for the right mm. people um, but mm. nevertheless, um, 
LinkedIn equally is yeah. the number one index site on Google. So if you want to look for somebody, you'll find them on Google anyway with their LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Um, so, you know, search absolutely is where it's at. And I think mm. because we're all living in such a crowded marketplace um, and there are literally millions of people working out of their bedrooms or their mother's bedrooms yeah <laughs> um that is where your competition is right so yeah so your search has you, you do need to be found on search and i often get pieces of business and people i say to people how did you find me and they go i don't remember but i searched for something and you came up so often people don't even know where they start with search <laughs> because yeah. you go down a rabbit hole and go, <laughs> how did I get here? Um, so it it's fascinating yeah. um, that you've gone into this kind of, you know, sector of the market. And, you know, there's a few other people I know that are in this space. Mm. Um, and it is overcrowded too, isn't it, Deepak? And how are you finding that over the last few years that you've been doing it? You know, it's interesting that people say that. I think, you know, digital marketing as an industry is still, is in, still in its infancy, really. Why right? do you say that? Because if you compare digital marketing as an industry compared to real estate, mm. then people, I think, often forget the references and people look at it too narrowly. I think digital marketing as an industry is still very much in its infancy. Why? Because there's still probably over 10% of the world that still get probably more that still yet to get broadband internet. There's still okay. e-commerce agencies that are yet to be built. There's still billions of dollars spent on TV ad spend because mm -hmm. people work with what they know and everybody loves the familiar and it's quite natural and quite human. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, there's, 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 there's still, you know, broadly speaking, a huge, huge opportunity for anyone to go within the digital industry and, and make a fabulous crack at it if you're good at what you do. Because the reason it's so big is because there's an even bigger economy to, to support digital. So I don't think it's small at all, right? And I think that it's, it's a very simple case of running the numbers in that, well, if I want to run a, you know, I don't know, let's just say I've run a half a million pound company, well, let's keep it, e let's keep it even easier. If I want to make 600 grand a year, that is 50 grand a month. To make 50 grand a month, I need 10 people that can pay me 5,000 pounds a month. To find 10 people that can pay me 5,000 pounds a month, they probably need to have a 100,000 pound minimum budget in terms of their actual marketing spend, because then maybe they can afford to spend half of it on search. But realistically, it's probably going to be more right. And, and when you start running the numbers and you think about what piece of the market that you need to actually become a success, then really, I think it's just a matter of case, uh, a case of as you just demonstrated with LinkedIn, how do I get seen and heard by these people? Or how do I, you know, do my best to make sure these people find me? Mm, interesting. Yeah. And it, it is a good way of doing that to try and pick out, um, you know, the slice of the market that you're after. Yeah. And it, yeah. I, I keep, it's very good to have that focus, isn't it? To kind of go, right, I, this is the bit of the market I'm after. I can't serve everybody, but I just want to serve these people. Absolutely. So the next pivot to, 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 to demonstrate that, which is where, you know, my business is going. And I think it's useful for, for, you know, once you reach, you know, what Paul Graham calls Raymond profitable, the most important thing day one, I think, when anybody starts any business is that you need to make money to keep your lights on. That's what just what I, you know, that's my perspective. In, in absence of having a cash flow that you can support yourself on to, to work perhaps strategically, what was b b important in the beginning was that I kept my lights on, so I did anything. Sure. Beyond, beyond that, I got to Raymond profitability, meaning that, right, I can basically pay my bills. It's sketchy because things, you know, I'm, I'm all over the place. I'm doing copywriting here. I'm trying to run an ad there. I'm doing a bit of LinkedIn here. It's like, it's a bit of a nightmare. And, and I can't grow without growing a little bit like, you know, a laptop from five years ago that comes with all of this bloatware that you get and you spend half an hour just uninstalling crap. So, you know, agencies often perhaps do grow like that. So what I then did was the second step, of course, was to narrow, right, let's do SEO. So now my discovery has been, you know what? I'm working with Magento. Now I'm working with custom code. Now this one's in, 
you know, this what the, 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 these guys have got theirs in, in Ruby on Rails. Okay, now we need to do, you know, Shopify. It's it's still not very streamlined. So the next step for Pearl Lemon in 2019 is to focus singularly upon e-commerce SEO. Right. Because we want to narrow further still. Why? Because then I can get really good at one vertical, e-commerce. I can make sure that I build a team that's very much focused on that. So, so again, you know, we've reached a, another stage of kind of profitability and recurring revenue within 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 the space of SEO. But you know, what this should hopefully be reassuring for your audience to know is that even within SEO, I'm deciding to focus singularly upon e-commerce to to just narrow my specialisms further still. And and I think that the fact that I'm doing that and that I'm able to do that demonstrates this industry is is is, is bigger than than anybody gives credit for and what actually is underneath that worry when people say aren't you worried is that a lot of service providers don't make a strong enough case to differentiate themselves and the biggest thing you need to do of course within anything that you do irrespective of one 10 1 million competitors is that you need to come to the market with a clear over unique competitive competitive advantage i'm talking about an advantage whereby people just see that you're obviously different from the first time that they meet look and encounter you whether that's inbound or outbound and i think that when you begin you know approaching the marketplace in that way then it doesn't matter how small or big a market is you can carve your own space out in it and and the it's interesting the whole e-commerce thing definitely mm. because what you've picked up on i mean it's not rocket science of course most yeah. people know this that that has huge amount still to continue to grow and um I'm glad you said that actually because I might be able to introduce you to an agency and I don't know if you're interested in working yeah. with agencies yeah. who are the one of the prime um partners of big commerce oh wow um in the UK and th they their focus their agency focus is all on e-commerce basically <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, and whether they've got enough people doing SEO in their team, it's only a small team in Birmingham, but yeah. I, I could introduce you to somebody, lovely guy, who could probably have a chat with you about that. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I'm That'd always thinking how I can connect people, so um, that might be an interesting one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it sounds fascinating where you are right now, and do you have – so having made that decision in terms of the market that you want to focus on, mm. how do you see that then over the next kind of three to five years growing? And I know you're a kind of distributed team. They're all in different mm. locations around the world. How do you see that developing? Will you continue to be virtual rather than physical? It's a good question, Michael. I, I <sighs> Right now, we're comfortable virtual. I know that... As we grow, I, 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 I put it this way: I don't know. The truth is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it as it comes. What, what, what I, what I do tend to do is, you know, I, I have broader goals, um, like financial goals, and then I just try and tack it down in, well, what's the quickest way for me to get to A to B? And I think that with 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 Pearl Lemon, you know, at, at the beginning there was a, a decent amount of churn when I had, you know disparate services I was offering and I was trying to figure out the process of remote recruitment in a way that was, you know, the delivery was there. And, and, and that was a whole kind of journey of itself. And now, you know, I think that I'm open to the idea of having a core team that I work with, but I've got, you know, so used to kind of working remotely that it still be perhaps almost alien to me <laughs> to, 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 to sit in an office with a bunch of people. And is it Signal 8? Or there's a couple of agencies that, uh, businesses rather, that, that do really well and that are completely distributed. So I think that, to be honest with you, I, it, would, it would require a significant shift to bring it in-house. Um, I, I, I do really think that being distributed poses a huge competitive advantage, I think, in terms of how you hire the, 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 you know, people that have in-house teams, I think that 
it's 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 night and day in terms of what you can kind of get in terms of ROI and delivery and all of these kinds of things if you become open to you know working with the army of of, of freelancers that oftentimes are struggling for work for themselves and what they actually really want is a job that allows them to work from home yeah i 100% and i mean the one company that i I I don't use their product anymore, but I used to follow and use their product and pay for yeah. their product and love the ethos. And I'm sure you you know them, which is Buffer. Mm. And Buffer are, are, had some locations. They closed them all down and became a fully distributed team around the world. And they've got quite a big team now around the world, people living and working in different time zones. And the benefits of that, of course, are that you're able to service customers across different time zones and yeah. be truly global too, um, which is, I'm sure, something that that's one of the main reasons why you're doing it too, <laughs> yeah. I guess. Um, so really, really fascinating. I know we've gone way over time, but it's, I, I didn't want to stop you. Oh, sorry. Um, no, no. I'm, I'm, I hope you're not stuck for another meeting or something. <laughs> um, but um, really, really fascinating, Deepak, to hear your story and the journey that, you, that you've been on. So... How how can people find you? Where where can they, you know, delve a bit deeper and read and watch and listen to to stuff that you're doing? Absolutely, two, two places. If you are interested in learning a little bit more about me personally, then you can head to deepakshukla.com or Google, of course, Deepak Shukla. You know, if if I'm doing something half right, of course it should come up. If you want to learn more about the SEO aspect and, and what we're doing as a business than Pearl Lemon. They're the two places, Michael, that people can find out more about me or the business that, 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 that I run. Fantastic. Well, I'll include those in the show notes as well. And, um, you know, I'll include your Twitter and your LinkedIn and everything so people can find you on there and follow you. And, Thank you. And is there something that you wanted to say to the listeners that that I haven't managed to get out of you, or do you think we've for now covered it? Covered all. I um. I think that the expression that Richard Branson, um, you know, sometimes refers to in some of his literature is something that you know. I've, 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 I've tried to live by it. And, you know, I hope within all of this, that would be the one message I'd say that you should take away that, you know, when, 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 when things or opportunities present themselves and you have that moment of fear, fuck it, do it anyway. <laughs> do it anyway. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> Deepak, um, I'll put you in touch with that contact I have. Um, oh, thank you, Mike. We'll do that via, via LinkedIn, probably. And then um, thank you so much for spending the time and sharing your story. Super interesting. And if you're ever in Birmingham or if I'm in, down in London, I'll give you a shout and maybe we can grab a bite of yeah. lunch. And um, so it would be lovely to see you in person and, 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 and shake your hand <laughs> as well. <laughs> And um, I'll be in touch soon. Thank you so Michael. much. No, thank you as well. And uh, please do, uh, when you send over some links, send me a couple of places that you'd like. If you could send me um, two places that you're, you'd like for me to leave you a review, whether that means a LinkedIn recommendation or, you know, your podcast, whatever it is. But if you could send me two places, I'll, I'll write some reviews for you, brother, buddy. That's really useful. Thank you so much for offering that. Much appreciated. Ah, no worries. Speak to you soon. Take care. Oh, Bye for now. Thanks. Bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 